talking about hunting and munting and yeah. So yes, I'm Leila Hussein, and actually, I don't know if the other speakers uh, struggled when I, when 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 I was told about the theme, radical beauty, and I thought, oh fuck, this sounds quite difficult. <laughs> It's too close to home because the word beauty and you know the word that we live it in. So I thought, how do I, which approach am I going to take this from? So I thought I look at it from the perspective of what society tells us what beauty is and what I grew up with and what I was told as a child and how, basically how I ended up on this stage. That will be like the story I'm going to be telling you. So if I tell you a quick background of who I am, next slide. If it comes on, so. I'm from a very, very beautiful part of um, Africa, East Africa, well, Horn of Africa. I'm from Somalia, in, uh, I'm from Mogadishu, and Somalia has the largest coast in the world, so it connects the Red Sea and the Blue, um, blue Ocean, <laughs> Indian Ocean. And by the way, that's something we're very, very proud of as Somalis, okay? And Somali got its independence in 1960. We are a nation of poets, but... I can't write one rhyme, but apparently we are, but we're very good at po uh, poetry, it's part of our tradition. I mean, the Somali language wasn't actually written until the 70s, so people do use poetry to communicate. So that's how we wrote letters. Um, I had a bit of a, uh, a, the way I was brought up, so my, um, I grew up in between Saudi Arabia, Italy, and Britain, so I'm a bit of a Cosmo child. Um, both of my parents, are, they were uh, both professionals. My dad was uh, an electric engineer. So he worked, he worked for an Italian company based in Saudi Arabia. So my memory as a child was living in a caravan park in the desert. So that was something I grew up with. And so, and Italy was literally my second home as a child. And, uh, and that's something, as you can see, as I'm talking, I'm moving my hands, my Italian side coming through. <laughs> yes. And uh, obviously I went to... Uh, uh, an Arabic nursery, <laughs> keep up with this, uh, Somali and an Italian primary school, then an English secondary school. <laughs> I remember telling my parents, where am I going to go for my college? Are we going somewhere else? <laughs> Do I have to learn another language? <laughs> so luckily I didn't. Um, I, uh, I'm not your typical Somali kind of, there's an image out there about Somalis where, you know, they have like 10, 11 kids and I only have two siblings. I'm so sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> And none of my families are pirates <laughs> or terrorists. Um, yes, um, our women are quite vocal, not the, the suppressed women that the media tends to portray at times. So that's my background. So I come from this beautiful part of the world. Next slide, please. I'm going to do like a little hip move when, so to make it look... Right, so I thought, okay, what define... What was, I mean, I was brought up in West most of my life, but for me, I just wanted to look at how the West defines beauty. And I must warn you, by the time I'm done with this presentation, some of you might want to go and run or do press-ups after, because I was quite feeling like, oh shit, I actually need to do press-ups as I'm preparing these slides. <laughs> because looking at the images out there, you just feel like, oh my God, okay, I don't fit into this, but anyway. So this is kind of how I've kind of gathered of what um, the West tells me to look like. Being size zero, um, silky long hair, tried, it doesn't work, um, big boobs, well, maybe a little, I'm not sure, um, the perfect vagina, that's another one, ah, what is the perfect vagina is the very question itself, I can't see what was at the bottom there, can you make it a bit dark so I can't see, oh yeah, straight white teeth, not really, I drink too much um, coffee and tea and they're not straight, and fair golden skin, because you know you can't be too pale or too dark. <laughs> right, next slide. So this is kind of what. So these are the images. Um, I really like JLo's picture. Damn, it's, it's gone missing. Um, Kim Kardashian. I mean, don't get me wrong. I really like Kim Kardashian, by the way. I like all these women. But for me, I think there's sometimes there is this um, images that we're bombarded with all the time. So if I don't look like Kim Kardashian, I. I could potentially be suicidal. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, my life. It's going to be horrible. Or there's an option of doing a sex tape. There's, there's another one. <laughs> right, next slide. So this is my community. And when I say community, I'm not specifically talking about the Somali community. I could be talking about my African background, being a black woman. You know, that's my community. And there's this idea of being... So I wasn't size zero, 
But there's the other spectrum now where I'm being told, oh, you, your bum's not big enough to be a black woman. You're not curvy enough. Actually, in, my, in the smiley community, the bigger you are, the more uh, um, privilege. So if your child's skinny, that means you're poor, you're not feeding them. So there's this, negative, uh, uh, um, there's this negative image around being skinny. So my poor mother went through a phase where she constantly wanted to feed me because people kept saying, oh, look, she's so skinny, you can see her veins. I remember, I'll never forget the word, oh, Laylee, you're, you, uh, you have, you're a nine-year-old with a 90-year-old hands. I'm not even going to lie, I had to go to therapy to deal with that. <laughs> it really affected me. Um, Video vixens, uh, who watches a lot of MTV videos. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about, the women with the big butt and which again, I don't have. Everything's all over the place with me right now. Uh, being married with kids, and if you're not married, you are not considered to be part of, uh, uh, of, this, of this particular community. If you're not married to the right man, to the right family, there are my kids. Usually when I tell people, uh, my, my community would say, oh, Layla, um, are you still single? And I'm like, yes. Oh, you were, oh when did you get divorced? Oh, I'm so sorry. And I said, no, I said, I'm happily divorced. <laughs> That's something, by the way, I live by. I'm very happily divorced. Um, I have an 11-year-old daughter, and I always get, oh, you have a daughter, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you don't have a son. So I usually have to grab their head and go, I'm fine. <laughs> Life is good. I love having my little girl at home. Um, relaxed hair. I mean, in the black community, if you don't, there is this, uh, I, there's this pressure to look a certain way. You need to have straight hair, li have light skin. I don't know if you guys have been watching um, the news recently. There's this Nigerian singer who's made, making billions out of bleaching cream skin. So there's one side where white women are told, you're too pale, so you need to be a bit brown. Where black women are told, you're too dark, you need to bleach yourself. So it's like, what the fuck? So... <laughs> As you can see, I don't fit into any of those boxes. So, right, next slide. Right, so this is a, oh yeah, the other one actually I forgot to say was I, there is, again, wearing hijab. Again, I have nothing against women wearing hijab. Or any, I mean, and I actually have a collection of abayas. And abayas, you know those long, black, silky ones? People think it's supposed to come. I find them actually to be quite sexy. I don't know about anyone else, you know? <laughs> you know, dark outfit with the eyes. Um, you know, big eyelashes, red lips. I mean, it's just, to me, it's like, wow, okay. I'm going to wear this more often. I actually have a collection. I'm not even kidding. I've got my funeral one. I've got my engagement party one. And I've got my wedding one. And I've got the Lady Gaga version. You do. Yes, that's, that's my best friend, by the way. Actually, I'm not joking. I do have a Lady Gaga version of Abides. So these are the images again. So I, as you can look at me, I don't look like any of these people. So again... In my community, to be a beautiful woman, you need to look, have that big butt and big boned, or oh, the video of Vixen on the side. That was the PG version I could find. Um, yes. Um, yeah, so that was, because the rest of them, <laughs> it scared me. And again, Beyonce, light skin, light hair, Rihanna, light skin, Sierra. By the way, I love all those girls. It's just, again, it goes back to, I, mean, I don't see women that look like me out there. I have nothing since I was a young girl. I didn't have anything that looks like me out there. Right, so before you go to the next slide, do not go to the next slide. I'm going to kind of lead you to the title of my uh, um, uh, talk. It's called The Hidden Scar. And what many people don't know is, like, I mean, as you can see, I'm wearing my nice jeans, my nice lovely top and my poofy hair. And a lot of people don't see women, they don't see the scars some of us carry. And uh, at the age of seven, I went through uh, a practice called female genital mutilation. Who's heard of that? Anyone in this room have heard of that? Okay, wow, this is the first time a lot of people in the room know what FGM is. Oh, that's great. Okay, good. So, next slide. Right, so those of you who don't know what FGM is, FGM type 1, it's when... Uh, the tip of the clitoris is either pricked or taken away, so it's either trimmed from the top. Uh, type two, it's when uh, the tip, uh, when the, the whole clitoris is removed, and they get the small labia joined together from the top and sew it, so they leave a, a bit of 
uh, hole for the <coughs> woman to urinate from. But one of the worst forms of FGM, it's FGM type 3 right at the bottom. As you can see, I don't know if you guys can see, but it's, um, they remove the big labias, the small labias removed, the clitoris is removed, and actually what they do is they pull the skin together and it's stitched to a point where you've got a very, very small hole and you are expected to urinate, menstruate, have babies, uh, have intercourse. So for a couple of seconds, just try to think that for a second, like urinating, can you imagine going to the toilet, which is something that a lot of people think, oh yeah, you know, I'm just gonna go and pee, but for the women who go through something like this, when they urinate, they can urinate for 20 minutes to 40 minutes because the literally is dripping. Next slide. FGM is practiced within more than 28 uh, African countries. It's practiced within the Middle East. Um, I think people, uh, when they think about FGM, they always assume it's this black child in a village. And t people tend to forget it also happens in the Middle East, it happens in uh, Malaysia, Indonesia. Um, and because of my, uh, the, the migration now in Europe and America and Canada, those communities are now based there, so FGM is now an issue for the Western world. Next slide. FGM is usually performed by an elderly woman who never be, who's never been to school, doesn't know how the body works, but if you come from a privileged family, I remember when I had mine done, I, because of who my family was, I had it done by a doctor and with, they said anesthetic, but I felt the whole thing. So um, they use uh, razor blades, stones, um, different types of instruments. And actually, when girls go, who go through FGM, they don't have it done by themselves. It's usually a group of women. I, when I had mine done, it was with my sister, my little cousin. Um, right. So next, next slide. By the way, I'm just using these slides to guide my talk. Basically, I'm being too lazy. <laughs> um, so let me just give you a couple of stats. Up to 140 million women have undergone FGM. That's a big number, it's not a small number. <laughs> Three million will undergo FGM every single year. In Europe, half a million women are living with FGM. They're living with it. In the UK, um, <laughs> Recent studies have shown, and this is without having proper uh, uh, data collection, but the estimate is that 170,000 women in the UK are living with FGM, and 66,000 are at risk every year, and this is just the UK. Every minute, five girls are cut, and I know I'm going to be here for 18 minutes, so you do the math of how many girls will be cut by the time I get off this stage. Next slide. So, how did Leila end up on this stage? I had to go through a lot of therapy. <laughs> I, it's, um, for me, this journey started when I got pregnant with my daughter, bless her, she's over there. So I'm gonna give this story so she can re realize <laughs> what mommy had to kind of go through. Um, I had a really horrible pregnancy. I went into a really dark, dark depression and nobody asked me a question, nobody said, Nobody thought, let's investigate what uh, Layla's experienced, but nobody asked me a question until I had a really horrible birth. I mean, it was a nightmare. That's why I still got one kid. I'm still traumatized by the whole experience. Um, and then I met uh, an amazing uh, practice nurse, who was also a counselor, Jennifer Board, who said to me, she was the first person to say to me, Layla, I know you're from uh, a part of the world where this particular practice is uh, used on young girls. Have you gone through it? And I remember my response. He was like, oh yeah, I've had it done. Yes, it's part of my culture. You know, this is who we are. It was fine, it was great. Oh my God. That's not what happened afterwards. And uh, I remember she invited me to one of her uh, uh, presentations she was doing on FGM. And I remember by the time we got to the second slide, I ran out of the room. I was literally angry, upset. And I, I, at the time I couldn't figure out why I was so upset. I was blacking out, to be honest. I was literally fainting. And she said to me, have you felt like this before? And I said, yes. I said, I felt like this every time I went to, to the maternity ward, every time somebody gave me a vaginal examination, I would black out. And she was the first person to say to me, Layla, your body was remembering. So I was experiencing flashbacks 
for a very, very long time. And straight away, obviously, I didn't go into therapy, but I, I think it was that moment I said, I do not want my daughter to go through what I went through. And I think that, that's really when it really hit me. And, and it, this is when... Um, Sorry, I get really emotional when I think about this. Um, it's quite difficult to talk about something so personal. Um, for me, trying to protect my daughter from the practice became an 11-year campaign. Why? Because there was nothing for women like myself out there. There was no shelters. What if my family decided to threaten me and said, no, you're going you, to go through this. Your daughter's going to go through it. I wouldn't, have gone any, I wouldn't have had anywhere else to go. I had no one to talk to. None of the counsellors who I met have ever heard of FGM. Anyway, which kind of led me to, I ended up working with, uh, with the, uh, the African Women's Service at Watham Forest, and I worked as a out, youth outreach worker. And as I was going along, my own anger and uh, 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 resentment was kicking in, and I remember just being extremely angry for, for many, many years. And this is when my colleague decided, you know, she goes, Leila, you need to take a break from work and go into therapy. You have to go into therapy or this is going to ruin your life. And I remember going into therapy and, you know, to cut this very long story short, therapy really saved my life. I'm not joking. I'm standing here because of the therapy work that I've had done because in the therapy space, it was the only time when somebody actually helped me acknowledge what happened to me as a child. No one's ever said to me, FGM is child abuse. FGM is a violation against women and girls. No one's ever used those words. I think when people talk about FGM, it's this idea of, oh, it's culture and it's their religion. We don't want to talk about it, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, fuck off. This is children. These are children. And for me, this idea of people not wanting to engage in something so horrific, it's just unimaginable. So for me... Obviously, therapy really helped me kind of uh, uh, deal with my anger and my resentment, and, and it helped me have that conversation with my mother because, you know, as much as we love our moms, my mom was, she planned this for me, and I really wanted to understand. And obviously, by listening to her story, I realized she went through, I mean, she was a victim herself, and in a way, we, we had uh, this, uh, we had this, uh, space where we can be together in solidarity because it was the first time I thought, oh my God, she's also a victim. Anyway, to cut this very long story very short, I'm sorry. And um, anyway, I went to train as a therapist myself because I realized all the counselors who I've met never heard of FGM, didn't know how to deal with it, and there were no support groups. So 11 years later, only recently, actually, this, uh, this really happened for me. Because when you, a lot of, I don't know how many of you are campaigners or, I mean, a lot of you who, who even organise are all volunteers. Self-care is not something that we never get taught from a very young age, especially as women. We are kind of brought up to kind of deal with everything on your own. You cope with it, you do everything. Oh, you multitask. No, you wouldn't ask a man to multitask. Why are you asking me to multitask? Anyway, so for me, oh, no, go back, go back. Sorry. That was supposed to be like a big surprise at the end. <laughs> So self-care, for me, it's what defines my beauty. So me taking care of Layla is what makes me feel beautiful. And I think this is what it was kind of leading up to, because one group was telling me I need to look a certain way. The other community was telling me this is how you need to look, you need to be curvy. But FGM is also practiced because, wait for this, it looks beautiful. So if I, don't, if I didn't have this done, I want to be accepted by men. So... Kindness, again, is my version of being beautiful. I think for me, there's nothing more beautiful than someone's caring and kind. Those days are over, you know, when I had a big crush on Justin Timberlake. <laughs> yes. So now I look for kindness and care. <laughs> and for me, humor is very beautiful. And a lot, I mean, for me, a lot of people say, Leila, how do you make jokes? When uh, you're talking about FGM, you have to. I mean, after the documentary on Channel 4, uh, Ed, people come up to me in the street and say, oh, Leila, how are you doing? And my response is like, yeah, you know, it's fine. It goes back to the small talk we had the discussion earlier. I'm like, yeah, you know, part of my genitals is still missing. I don't know what to do, you know. <laughs> so, it's, you know, you have to break that ice and make it okay to talk about it. So for me, humor is a part of, again, me feeling beautiful and what... Uh, being confident is what beautiful now... Uh, that's how I define beauty. It's not 
uh, what jeans I'm wearing or how my hair is done or what kind of lipstick. I like doing that, don't get me wrong. Um, but for me, it's, it, I shouldn't be judged on based on what, uh, um, how I look, especially in my community, you know, before you get married. Have you had FGM done? Have you had FGM done? No? Oh, you're dirty. You can't, can't, you, you're promiscuous. You're going to sleep with everybody. Oh, by the way, just to clarify, there was this idea of women who've had FGM done don't have sex before marriage. That's not true at all. It hasn't worked, basically. So the next slide, even I think some, something went wrong with it. Go to the next slide. Basically, it's me saying I tried to do the pouting pictures. It didn't kind of work out for me. Yeah, it didn't. I tried to do this. I was in a good mood that day. I really do think, I was, and I was in Kenya, so I think it, there was a reflection of the sun and me pretending I was sexy. It was quite a difficult position to be in. But that, the, the, the hijab, was, see that, basically, what my point of these pictures is, I'm all those women. I'm not just one particular group. You will see me wearing that. You'll be saying, wearing my Somali clothes. Oh, yeah, that, was, that picture's missing, but it was for me to say... Um, don't do that when you're on a date or anything because it's not, fu it's not funny. It's not making a, a poker face. Yeah. Anyway, next slide. Just, can I just do one more? Okay, this is very... Just one more thing. Um, I'm going to read a letter to you guys. So this is my... Um, I'm, 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 I'll do this in every three months. And I suggest everybody should do this. Because, and this idea came about because I moaned for many, many years, I never received a love letter. Then I said, do you know what, I'm going to write one for myself. So I would suggest you, and it's quite therapeutic, don't get me wrong, it's very good. So let me, um, I'll be quick, I promise. So, my dearest Layla, I hope my letter finds you well. First and foremost, I want to apologize to you for always making you feel you are not smart enough, that you are not uh, a good daughter, sister, or a friend and that you are a terrible mother who put her child at risk by speaking out against FGM. Well, I have got a panic alarm at home, so I did put my child at risk. Sorry, Faye. Um, I also would like to apologize for constantly telling you that you are not beautiful, and for sometimes telling you you are, not, you are better than... Oh, shit, what was I saying? For telling you <laughs> it better be better if you are not around because the pain and shame is too much to bear. I'm writing this letter to tell you how much I love you and I'm extremely proud of you. You are here for a reason. It's okay if you, ca if you can't always be perfect mum, sister, friend, or a colleague. You are at your best when you allow yourself to be vulnerable around those who you love. I know at times you don't notice that amount of love around you, but I'm proud of you for seeking therapy when the world didn't make sense and everything turned dark and lonely. Layla, you survived FGM. You moved to the UK at the age of 12 without speaking English. <laughs> and now you are writing a blog on the Huffington Post. So I have my own page on Huffington Post, yay. <laughs> the Dahlia Project was your dream and you have made it come true. You are providing a safe space for women like you who survived FGM, a place where they can share their most painful experiences. I want to tell you, that you need to be uh, as kind and generous to yourself as you are to others. As I end this letter, I want to remind you that since the release of your documentary, The Cruel Cup, you have received endless emails, tweets, Facebook messages from strangers who told you that they loved you and admired you. The message of, uh, the message of love <clears throat> have completely obscured everything negative. This may be the first love letter from me but you have received many already. All you need to do is accept the love you are being showered with. Lots of love. Leila, P.S., I'll write to you very soon.